Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Natalie Stetson. I am the director here at the Erie Canal Museum. Um, we're so glad to have you in the room with us. And those of you who are here virtually, we're glad to have you as well. Um, the impact of the Erie Canal was immense, socially, economically, and politically. Today, we will hear about how the canal overcame the daunting challenge of Skahari Creek, a major tributary to the Mohawk River. This is our fourth lunchtime lecture of 2022, with this year's theme being infrastructure. This program was funded in part by Humanities New York with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we thank them for their support. Our next lunchtime lecture is on May 19th. It will also be a hybrid program with the in-person and virtual options. That lecture will feature New York State Canal Corporation Director of Waterway Management, Ambrose Barbudo, who will look at the work that is done by canals uh, over the winter to keep the modern canal system operating and ready to go for the summer. He should have a lot to talk about um, since he'll be here joining us one day before the canal opens up for the navigation season. Also, as we begin to enjoy the warmer weather, we're happy to announce the return of our popular History Happy Hour series. Some of you may remember these from before the pandemic, but they will be a little bit different this year. Instead of being weekly events here at the Waylock, we're partnering with a few different breweries and restaurants to host happy hours at their sites. The first happy hour will be at Willow Rock, <clears throat> Willow Rock Brewing Company uh, next Thursday, April 21st. It begins at five o'clock with an optional bike ride here from the museum um, to the brewery. Willow Rock will be debuting a new Erie Canal inspired beer based on the 1907 canal claps over Onondaga Creek, which our educator, Derek Pratt, that's him there, um, will give a brief historic talk about at 6.30. Following Derek's talk, the brewers will share information about making the beer. And then finally, we will reveal our 2022 summer cycling programs. We hope you can join us for this fun and informative event. We'd also like to uh, highlight an event happening next month at Skahari Cro Crossing at 7 p.m. on May 19th, when said educator, Derek Pratt, will be giving a virtual presentation on the home of the Erie Canal Museum, the Syracuse Waylock Building. That presentation is free and open to the public, and we'll make sure we put a link to registration in the chat. And now on to the main event. We are happy, very happy to welcome David Brooks. He is currently the education director at Skahari Creek or Skahari Crossing State Historic Site in Fort Hunter, New York, within the system of sites operated by the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. Skahari Crossing interprets and preserves the significant history of the Erie Canal and its contributions to New York State, as well as to the nation. David also sits on the board of trustees for Fulton County Historic Society, Historical Society, and Montgomery County Historical Society, as well as being the president of the Mohawk Valley Museum Consortium. Uh, if you have any questions while David chats, please save them to the end, or you're free to add them to the chat at any point, and we will save time at the end to ask some questions. And with that, I'd like to welcome David to the podium. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you to the Erie Canal Museum. I'm going to do this microphone thing. And hopefully everybody can hear me. I was given the instruction that I should make sure there's Velcro attached at some point. I'm not sure where that will be, but I'll put that on. So hopefully everybody can hear me. It's strange to even have a microphone that isn't on a headset and there's actually physically people in front of me. So I apologize in advance to those that are here. I might be a little bit rusty. It's been a little while since giving a presentation to an actual room of people. Um, the last in-person presentation I gave was at a library and we did it outside which was a lot of fun and the birds even enjoyed it. So again, I'm Dave from Schoharie Crossing. I'm gonna be talking about how the Erie Canal crossed through and then over the creek. Might jump around just a little bit. So if I lose you, please make sure you ask or give me, if you're in person, give me kind of a, a weird look and I'll try to clue in on the fact that maybe I need to revisit part of the topic. Um, we're gonna talk about the Erie Canal at the Schoharie Creek. But first, some of you may be thinking, where the heck is Schoharie Crossing? Uh, but at least by a show of hands in the room, some of you have been there. So I just roughly put this up. It's about an hour and 40 minutes drive from the Erie Canal Museum here in Syracuse. And along that way, if you're going to make the trek from Syracuse to Schoharie Cross, there's plenty of other cool places to stop and check out canal history and other history as well. But here at Schoharie Crossing, so those of you that are there in person here, you'll notice uh, I do have it brought up. It is where the Schoharie Creek meets the Mohawk River. So let me just dispel any myths or, or falsehoods in your thinking as it is not in Schoharie and it's not even in Schoharie County. It is in Montgomery County. Again, 
at the banks of the Schoharie Creek as it meets the Mohawk River. And we're going to be talking about how the Erie Canal went through or over that creek. It was a major impediment to the east-west transportation corridor of the Erie Canal. So kind of getting that out of the way, I'll have to bring in the nuts and bolts, the perfunctory, you're at a presentation that involves Schoharie Crossing. So I do have to discuss that it was going back in the 1950s when it was, there's this big push to preserve Erie Canal historical features and landmarks in New York State. Uh, and part of that was this push in Montgomery County by the historian uh, to the Board of Supervisors and eventually to the state saying that 400 is the most logical site for the Erie Canal Restoration Museum. Uh, being that we have a section of the original Clinton's Ditch, the 1820s canal, segments of the enlarged canal, and being extremely adjacent to today's modern barge canal system. Uh, so the 400 Canal Society began a 10-year campaign in order to save the canal features and structures in Fort Hunter uh, and actually petitioning to the government, the federal government, to have it listed as a national landmark. Uh, so the Erie Canal features at Schoharie Crossing are on the National Register for Historic Landmarks, and doubly so because today's modern system is also a national landmark. Um, so it, we even have one of those really cool heritage corridor stamps if you want to come and get your, your passport stamped. Um, so Erie, the Schoharie Crossing as a state site opened in 1966 underneath uh, Governor Rockefeller. Interpretive services uh, really kind of held in 1987 with the opening of the Visitor Center. And we are still open today. Well, the Visitor Center will open on May 1st, runs through the end of October. For you to come out and check our Pathway to Empire exhibit, you can always find us online for those hours. Uh, but the grounds, the best part is the grounds of the site, we are stretched out over about two and a half miles of towpath trails, of boat launch picnic areas. Yankee Hill Lock has a canal store that the lock features. It is open from sunrise to sunset every day. So even if you can't come see me at the visitor center, you can come explore our history. That being said, we're going to talk about damn that creek. And I use that in all sorts of ways. So as they're coming up with the idea to build the canal, one of the major issues is always, if you're going east or west and you have a south or north flowing body of water, you're going to have to cross it in some way or another. Hence, Schoharie Crossing. So in the creation of the blue line, the survey line from Buffalo to Albany or Albany to Buffalo, depending on which direction you feel like talking about. Charles Broadhead is assigned to survey that section that will encompass up to the Schoharie Creek from Rome. Um, the interesting part is from Schoharie Creek towards Schenectady going east, they didn't really know what they were going to do, even when they broke ground on July 4th of 1817 in Rome. Um, it's sort of a, a good example of, um, let's see what we can come up with. We'll do the work, we'll get there and figure it out along the way. Um, as a male, I'm pretty familiar with that. That happens quite a bit in my life. So there's already an established region of settlement, the Mohawk Valley in particular, uh, from Ro uh, even Rome towards Connecticut has obviously already been settled, not only by the Haudenosaunee for centuries, but European settlement uh, has moved into the valley and settled for, at this point, over 100 years. So you have established settlements, communities along that waterway, uh, even connected the westward, uh, the Western Inland Lock Navigation Company. Um, so you, you already have this kind of nuance that you have to do when it comes to creating infrastructure in an area that has settlement. You're going to upset some people and benefit others. Jervis is in charge of the engineering this section. He had gone from being an axeman on the, the survey for the canal uh, as a younger man to actually an engineer uh, by this, this time uh, in 1820s, the early 1820s when they're really going to be starting to do this project at the Schoharie Creek. Uh, in charge of the noses to Amsterdam, formerly Port Jackson, the south side of Amsterdam. So Port Jackson is what you might be familiar with talking about the canal. Uh, Sweets Canal Store. So anybody that's been in that area, hopefully if you haven't, you should visit. It's great. The Mohawk Valley Gateway Overlook Bridge has a bunch of cool projects and uh, events and programs that go on. Um, and then you're really, really close to Schoharie Crossing. Uh, so you can stop in and visit us. It's all of that's overseen by Benjamin Wright and underneath the Canal Commissioner, Henry Seymour. And I have to put the iconic image of the canal going through the Mohawk Valley. And you see those two great 
um, elements there of the noses, big nose and little nose, that narrow gap in the Appalachian mountain change, the narrowest kind of section, the most seed level crossing of that mountain chain from Georgia to Maine. And actually it gives New York state the geological advantage to create the Erie Canal, uh, which would lead to a great success as we should all know. If you're tuning in for this or you're here live, uh, you should know. And again, that impediment being the Schoharie Creek, you want it both to go east or west and you have a body of water flowing to the north. It's a flood prone area all along the Mohawk Valley, but particularly at the Schoharie Creek. I mean, for those of you that might be familiar in even recent history, it was only about 11 years ago that there was a major flood from Hurricane Irene uh, on the Schoharie. But it needs to be utilized. It is going to be a primary source of water for the canal because what is a canal without water? It's, it's a ditch. It's, it's just a ditch. So you need water and it'll be a primary source almost all the way to Albany. Um, eventually they're gonna come up with this idea as they figure it out. They can also pull a great deal of water near Rexford uh, from the Mohawk River uh, as they cross over and then back over the river. And it would need a slack water dam to do so. They originally thought, you know, we could put an aqueduct here. It's gonna be about 700 feet long. It's gonna cost us about $40,000. Um, but then they realized that's quite a chunk of money and it's quite a project. And at this location, near where the old military road had crossed through those uh, low water area of the Schoharie Creek. Um, it's not really in the plan. It's not really in the budget. It's kind of difficult to do. This is early 1820s. They've already got a few miles of canal dug and they're still kind of working it out. The engineers are still essentially learning on the job. They're really smart, but you're learning on the job, which is kind of what I do every day actually. And so we're going to be talking about that spot right there. Again, at the old site of Fort Hunter, so our pre-canal history with the British colonial Fort Hunter that existed there next to the lower castle of Mohawks. Um, it's an ideal place. It's actually been a location because there's a military road and that has been an area in which people co could very easily traverse or get ferried across or under low water circumstances, just walk through the creek, the creek that you would see today when you come to visit during the season drastically different than the creek of 200 years ago. Which actually we kind of got a glimpse at. So if anybody had been out to the site or you've seen on our social media posts from July of 2020 when today's modern canal system hadn't opened yet because of the pandemic, uh, there's some great images of some of the remnants that I'll be discussing uh, here. But that kind of gives you an idea of how low that water would be that you could actually walk across the creek. I wouldn't try to do that in July uh, anymore. Uh, if you want to swim across it, if you want to paddle across it, I wouldn't try to, to walk unless uh, you have really cool floaty shoes and you can actually make it away. So again, we're going to talk about this little highlighted area of the Schoharie Creek and how we're going to dam it. So this is a wonderful image showing the original crossing location of the Erie Canal at the Schoharie Creek. Uh, and so toward the lower portion of that off to what would be your right is a bridge. Uh, wound up being a toll bridge during uh, the 1830s. Um, but that is not the primary form of conveyance of the canal uh, to get the, the boats across. So you have uh, on this bottom edge is lock 19 or 35, depending on which way you want to number it on the original because they went in different directions and then they changed it. So I'm just going to refer to it as 19 because that's how it's in my head. Uh, and the opposite side is where up near where it says the site of the old Fort Hunter is the East Guard Lock. But we're going to be talking about this other structure where it actually says dam. So it's nice that they label that. John Little John Jr. was awarded contract 353 by the New York State Canal Commission Fund. Uh, New York State said, since we're going to create this slack water dam in order to put the barges through the creek, this guy can do the work. There he is. It's a, a dapper John Little John. Much, much older than he was at the time. He was born in 1790 in Massachusetts, fought in the War of 1812, hence Colonel Little John. He was a colonel. And he married Eleanor Newkirk in 1823, which just so happens to be about the time that he was working at this location of crossing the Schoharie. And we'll get a wonderful, nice image of Eleanor as well. 
And I will have you note that below where it says married Eleanor Newkirk in 1823, down at the bottom on that map, if you cannot read that, it says Abraham Newkirk. Just keep that in mind. Little John's later work would involve incline plane railroads and other canal projects in New York State and actually um, the Baltimore and Ohio and a few others down near the James River. So we developed some contracts, some connections, maybe some expertise in other things that he had been doing, which helped him get other canal contracts as well. And what does that mean? So this is an image actually from the Canal Commission Fund. You can get in the New York State Archives, you go in there and you take a look at it and it's great because it tells you who was making what money and for what. Some of it's in pen, some of it's in pencil. So I'll kind of break this down a little bit. Again, contract 353 for Little John. And the dates start off in 1821, where he's awarded this contract in July to begin that work. And it runs actually through until 1823 on another section here. But this one primarily is 1821, 1822. So the dam is being constructed during that time period, 1821. And he operates there, the dam, the scow, and the ferry in 1823. And that would be the, the way in which a canal boat, this section, particularly between Utica and Schenectady, because the entire canal is not open until 1825, but the Utica to Schenectady section is definitely in operation at this time. And you come up on the Schoharie Creek and you're gonna see Little John there and or some other form of family or a state authority that's going to be operating, you know, making sure the dam's intact and the water level's high enough. And if you wanna cross that typically your draft animals, the bridge isn't in use at this point. There isn't really a bridge that is gonna function for a towpath. So your draft animals are put onto a, a scow or ferry and you are moved across that way. And there's a windless rope system in which on the other bank, there's a team of horses that are going to spin a wheel that will pull your loaded cargo from one side to the other. Abraham Newkirk replaces Little John as that lock operator when Little John is done with it. We already discussed Newkirk. He's related to John's new wife. So all right. So the total cut should I pause? We good? All right. Technical problems. You know they had that on the canal too. Uh particularly with the dam. I'm gonna cover some of those technical dam problems that they have. Awesome. All right. So I, I love the ability to be here in person and have it virtually. The hybrid thing is totally fun. And, and the more we do it in this new kind of world that we have now, um, the better it will get. So the total cost of the dam and Little John's services come out to over $17,000. So that is roughly, oh, I'll put it just shy of half a million dollars today. That, uh, that, that covers the cost of the materials and the, the other labor for construction of the dam. That's not all just Little John stuffing his, his pockets. Um, so we're not exactly sure how much he actually made off from it after having to pay off the rest of the labor and the material costs because of the way that it is actually written out in that, that ledger um, as well. Button. It seemed like it worked and now the advancer is not working. <laughs> Little John? Yeah. 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 It's, there we go. Awesome. Yeah. And um, remind me if I don't bring it up, there's a little bit more about Little John and, and stuff. I think it's in here. So, 1822, we're going to be talking about the dam. I'll reset my brain where I was. The original dam in the 1822 Little John construction is eight feet high, 650 feet long, and it's a timber dam that's set in on piles, filled in and cribbed with stone. So the idea is that we're gonna build this thing, eight feet, it'll bring up that level. Lock 19 is about six feet. Uh, so being able to, if you're headed west to east uh, with a six feet lift, you're actually, oh, you're being lowered about six feet because you're going down at that section. And that puts you across the creek, the east guard lock, and um, beyond to the lock 20 
is all at that level. Um, and it's anchored in wings of stone masonry. And its first use, mind you, its first use lasted 10 years. Its second use lasted 12. Um, because as I like to illustrate, particularly when fourth graders come to the site, uh, this idea of recycling of uh, materials and recycling of, of spaces is not a new concept. And when it was completed in 1822, uh, this was actually noted in the newspapers and actually the canal commissioner uh, at the time, it said it is a work of considerable magnitude across the stream, which at times sweeps away almost every opposing obstacle. This is, however, a substantial work. And as it has an elevation of only eight feet, it is believed to be capable of resisting the force of the greatest floods. I see some shaking heads here. Well, first off, I already gave you the spoiler because it only lasted 10 years in its first use. So, um, and again, if you're familiar at all with the Scoharie, the Scoharie eats dams, it eats, eats bridges. It is a, a raging torrent or it's extremely calm. Uh, it can be very misleading. So if you spend a lot of time near the Scoharie um, and particularly where it meets the Mohawk River, uh, it's at the end of a 90 mile journey is a major watershed for this Catskills um, and has a lot of nice twists and turns in it. So it is uh, at that point really kind of barreling through. So we're gonna continue the dam process. That again, it washes out by 1832. Uh, there's spring floods that take out chunks of it. Ice is an ongoing problem in the area. The raging waters, particularly in the spring, when it is carrying giant chunks of ice. There's some great images from about 1900 uh, outside the visitor center where I have my office and the, the exhibit is where there's almost like Volkswagen beetle sized chunks of ice that have managed to be over the, the bank of the Schoharie Creek during a, the flood. So the March flood removes 150 feet of the dam. They fix it just in time for the April flood to remove 100 feet of the dam. And again, they need to repair it by July. See, this is giving a lot of people some headaches, right? So they decide by 1832, the end of that, they're gonna build a new dam and they're gonna do so in probably the most inhospitable kind of weather because the best time to build a dam is when there's not really a lot of rain or flowing in that creek, which means it's going to be cold. It'll be December, um, which sounds like a, a hoot and a holler for everybody else that likes to work inside. So this new dam is going to have continuous problems as well. Uh, the idea being is that the Schoharie kind of likes a dam that will give a little bit. It wants to create a path for some of that water to go and not really hold it up to that eight feet of elevation that you need for the canal. Uh, it's also creating a lot of silt behind it. So you're having sections that have to be cleared out upstream from the dam because now your boat doesn't have enough draft room for it to get through. Same with the East Guard Lock, it's getting filled in. So that's kind of the story for the first two major components of the dam and its operation. And a little bit of a spoiler alert that it's still going to be utilized by 1845 as part of the feeder system when the aqueduct opens. How many of you knew that there was going to be an aqueduct in this story? All right, so I'm glad to see a bunch of hands. 1849, additional works and the 1850 floods entirely destroy the dam that was present at that location. So that 1822 one, again, they'd rebuilt one in 1832, 1822 one, it gets recruited again. You're going back to work. Coming out of retirement. I did that once. And they really decide by 1862 that they are going to get a little bit serious about this, even though the dam itself isn't used for navigation at that location, because again, aqueduct, getting a little bit ahead of myself, but you still need that water. I mentioned before, it's a primary source of water until you get towards connecting in Albany. You need water from the Scoharie Creek to be diverted down the old Clinton's ditch to the enlarged system in order to navigate because again, a canal without water is a, it's just a ditch. All right. So that one winds up being a lot more. They're going to put some concreted stone in there. We're going to really make this. It's almost like it didn't work the first few times. We're going to go overboard with it by using concreted stone uh, at a cost of, well, what would roughly be, $618,000 in today's dollars. 
only 450 feet. They're going to use a slightly different part of the creek bank, still eight feet, and that lasts two months. So a wonderful state project. Repaired, patched, and kept in service. And this is this ongoing seasonal issue every year, multiple times. There are going to be work scows out there fixing this dam. 1864. What's also happening in 1864, just uh, as a reference point for the historical people? The Civil War is happening. All right. So they decided, though, that they're going to build a tree dam. It's still so important to have a dam. You still need this water. They haven't figured out some other source of water. It's going to be 11 feet. We're making this bigger. That's what New Yorkers do, right? Making it bigger and better. 400 feet long. They're using a slightly different part of the creek now. And they're going to use 1,400 trees. They're all 70 to 90 feet tall, 18 to 22 inches around at their butts. Uh, and again, this is during the Civil War. Labor and materials are expensive because they are being used for the war effort, particularly in 1864, as Union forces are really trying to strangle Confederate forces by using the, the might of federal ingenuity and industry of the North. The materials and the industry to win the Civil War. Uh, so that's going to cost a little bit more, just under, but I'll call it almost a million dollars to build the dam at Schoharie Creek in today's money. You're going to build a dam in the Schoharie uh, now. I'm sure it would be way more than that. But in 1864, about $45,000 is a lot of money for the state to put into a single dam as part of the system. And uh, yeah, it gets damaged. But you know what? It actually lasts and holds up pretty well until this new canal, the Barge Canal, takes over in the early 20th century. Uh, and there are actually some really cool segments of the dam that you can see at our site today in the non-operating season. Uh, so I'll kind of point this out. This is a wonderful uh, map that's created as part of a Canal Society bottoming it out brochure that came out back in, I think, the late 60s, kind of illustrating where those were based off of several of the other maps out of the state archives and actually segments that you can see at the site of stone cribbing and timbers that still remain. So you have the original dam as dam number one and then you have the second one they're handily labeled one two three and four uh those here in the audience can't see that let me know i can kind of point that i'll just kind of illustrate so you have the first one second one third one and you don't have to worry about the navigation here anymore because again the aqueduct I'm getting ahead of myself with the aqueduct and four so we're talking about infrastructure and these kind of things overlap so so i said it's almost like a uh uh Doctor Who episode where I'm going to jump around through time, or I'd actually prefer Bill and Ted. I think that'd be more fun if I got in the phone booth and, and, uh, and, and the, the younger person in the back, if you haven't seen Bill and Ted, you really should. Um, it's totally worth Netflix. All right. And so this isn't really the brightest of images. So hopefully it's coming out clearly, uh, but this is showing the, uh, the tree dam as it would be built uh, later on the, the late, the last version of the tree dam and how the stacked wood, uh, those large trees being stacked with the butts toward the north, that's downstream, and the tops of the trees actually with some of the branches still attached to it so they could, when they pile on the stone and the other uh, sand and giant, giant stones again, uh, that rubble is going to hold it in place. Uh, they eventually use some boards to create an angle on the downslope so that those chunks of ice can wash over it. Um, and it makes it much more sustainable. It does leak some. And actually by 1887, they actually create a fishway. So spawning fish can go back up the creek as part of a conservation effort. Um, but that, the ability for it to leak a little bit and the ice over top is probably the, the major innovation with this last dam and why it will actually last the longest out of all of them into service uh, till the early 20th century. Um, they've come a long way in figuring out what they needed at the Schoharie. And uh, William Taylor is the engineer in the middle, state's uh, engineer. Uh, he'd been uh, an engineer and a state engineer and actually wound up being the city engineer for Utica for a handful of years as well. Uh, political appointee, though, because as soon as the other party gets in office, he doesn't have a job anymore uh, until his party gets back in office and he gets a job again. Uh, the rest of the dignitaries that are up on this, so this is the 1864 version of it. What I like at the top image 
is that there's actually a view looking to the north. So you see the aqueduct crossing the Schoharie, um, as well as some of the work scales. And then the bottom image is actually from the aqueduct looking to the south, showing that 11 foot impressive dam that held water up, slack water system in the creek. Again, not for navigation, but strictly to provide water to the rest of the enlarged Erie Canal during that period of time. And they got the, the nice big hats. So. You know, and again, there's that that image looking to the south. And for those of you interested in a little bit of our pre-canal history, I'll, I'll do this because particularly I kind of have you in a captive audience in some way or another. Uh, the rise in the ground beyond the work scows is where the New York State Thruway actually crosses over the, the creek now. And it is most likely the location for the original Lower Castle or Tyanandarog village of the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawk people at that location, why the fort was built right there as well. And again, these wonderful big, I, I'm kind of jealous of the top hats. I really am a little bit. Um, I can't get away with that look. I'm working on it as best I can, but I can't, I don't have the, the rest of it. So we're going to recap a little bit about the dam, particularly the original, because um, I find Little John an interesting character in and of himself. He winds up moving to Allegan County in Michigan after doing several of these other projects on railroads down near the James River. And he sets up a pretty prosperous business in the mill industry uh, and other enterprises to the point where there's actually in Allegan County, Michigan, there is a park called Little John Park. Uh, and some of the information about Little John actually comes from an early publication of the history of that county. So props and thanks to the, uh, the county recs department out there for providing information to me a few years ago when I was doing research on this. Um, he retires in the late 1850s, probably as a result of some of the wounds. There's no real detail as to what his wounds suffered at the Battle of Lundy's Lane, otherwise known as the Battle of uh, Niagara Falls in Ontario, Canada, during the War of 1812. And he's, he's out on a retirement slash business trip to Omaha when he passes away in 1868. Um, and I don't, yeah, no, it's not in this one, but I'll, I'll get to it. There's this other part, for those of you that might be knowledgeable enough of some of the other cool connections that we might have at Schoharie Crossing. Little John had a son, Abraham Newkirk Little John. It's interesting where they got that name from. Probably Abraham Newkirk, the, the relative of his wife, who happened to also in 1826 drown in the creek. Uh, Abraham Newkirk Little John actually winds up becoming the head of the Long Island Diocese. He's a reverend and is the, the gentleman that actually does the consecration ceremony at the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, and then the side note to that for Montgomery connection, County connection as well, is that a lot of the stone for the Brooklyn Bridge came from Canajahari, which is just up the canal from Schoharie Crossing. And there's a little bit more on that. You can find it on our blog. You can check that out. So the dam remnants, uh, again, showing a few of these images, the early 1900 image of the water going over the dam. And there are some timbers that still exist there from that 1864. If you're out in the off season when it's cold, or if there isn't water in the creek for whatever reason, there's uh, an emergency situation where they open up dams in today's Mohawk River, you can go out and see that. There are a couple that you can kind of see if you're out paddling. So if you want to come and kayak around the aqueduct, uh, there's a few of them that stick up far enough that you can see. Uh, but when the water level is really low, you do see like the bottom sill, the stonework uh, for a couple versions of the dam that are out there. Uh, this is not the greatest panoramic image, but this was, uh, if you were visiting the site today, you'd be able to see this rift uh, from that version. That would have been, again, uh, about the 1864, which is close alignment to that early 1820s version of the dam and, and be able to check that out. And when the water was extremely low in July of 2020, I actually saw people walking across that. Uh, which kind of gave me like, ah, because you're walking across it, but it's also kind of cool because you're walking across a piece of history you don't normally get to see. But I already mentioned the aqueduct. So who, who wants to hear about the aqueduct? Okay, it seems like there's a good response to that. So if you're on Zoom, give a thumbs up on that one. Uh, Otis Eddy's aqueduct. All right. Just a quick recap, though. The original Erie Canal opens in 1825. It's an immediate success. The enlargement begins in 1836. Improvements to the system, a bigger canal, bigger locks, they double chamber locks. So I already talked about the dam. You're navigating through it. Those are single chamber locks, one boat at a time. 
when the water's moving, they close it and there's a big backlog. It's like being on the New York state Thruway when they close down an exit. And especially now where like every other rest stop is closed and you have to like actually take an exit to use a restroom. Like I had to this morning. Is that too much information, Natalie? Okay, cool. All right. So that's a quick recap on that. So they're going to enlarge the Erie Canal. And what that means at the Schoharie is finally an aqueduct. Like a few decades of them having to mess around with that dam and all of the issues. Like it was one of the worst things. If you're operating a boat between Schenectady and Utica, particularly on the regular, you dreaded getting to the Schoharie. It was a traffic jam. If the water was moving too fast, you're held up. They're going to close the gates and you can't get across it. And if you try, you might be going over the dam like the Hudson did. A packet boat that went over, broke out its windows. And thankfully, nobody died. Um, so congratulations, New York State, of realizing that an aqueduct is absolutely necessary at the Schoharie. So they put it out. That is actually a notice for bids on a contract, New York State. They're releasing down in... Virginia. That is the Richmond Inquirer in June of 1838. And at this point, canal mania has struck all of America, not just New York. Everybody wants a canal. They're the hot ticket item. They're like the fidget spinner of the 1830s. That is also a dated reference. Thank you for following along. They were a hot thing for like, yes, <laughs> the hot second. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the construction of the Schoharie Creek Aqueduct, this is a little bit fuzzy, so my apologies, but it is saying for construction of an aqueduct across the Schoharie Creek of about 600 feet in length and a section of canal adjoining the same. That's what they need. They need somebody to build an impressive structure as Roman arches over a Native American body of water right there to carry the canal over the creek. And look at that. They're going to start construction in 1839. They got somebody. Somebody said yes. They're like, yes, I want to do this. Here's my bid. And New York State said, you're on it. Sign this contract, which, spoiler, Otis Eddy agreed to. He signed it as well as somebody in his name uh, earlier. Uh, quick aside, because I'm thinking of it. Actually, in the contract, it says that Otis Eddy could not provide his workforce with ardent spirits during the construction of the aqueduct. Uh, it's one of the best lines of a contract I read. But this all happened during the economic recession of the 1830s, which kind of plays into why Otis Eddy is going to be doing this to begin with. But we're at the tail end of this economic recession that's really impacting New York State and the enlargement of the canal. So the stop and tax law puts kind of a, a halt to a lot of projects, but they're still going to move forward with this. They're, they're saying this is super important. This is one of the biggest improvements we're going to put. And while it suspends many projects, it's going to keep on pushing. It's going to tell Otis Eddy, you need to get this work done. You have until December of next year to do so. Do it according to contract. Oh, yeah, like things cost more and it's a little more difficult to get the materials. And you have to take out lines of credit to do it because we're not going to give you money yet. But but do it. We're going to we're going to help you know, like. And it's supposed to be completed by October of 1840. He takes on additional lines of credit. He's got to pay for the materials. He's got to pay his labor. But he doesn't complete it until December of 1841 because it's kind of difficult to do a lot with a little. And he's not receiving payment on that contract. It's completion. So when it is completed in 1841, he's going to spend the next almost two years trying to figure out how he's going to get paid. And he wants to get paid not only for the original contract, but also these extra lines of credit he had to take because he was told to complete the project despite the stop and tax law. It goes into operation 1845. So there's this roughly four year gap as it's awaiting other projects. They were suspended because the state has suspended work on the canal. So all of this work that Otis Eddy and his labor force had been doing to construct this great aqueduct is just hanging out. Um, and there's a lot of wrangling. What's really fun is looking at the, the newspapers during the 1843, 1844, in particular in early 1845, saying for a mere $90,000, the aqueduct could be put into use. They need to complete these projects because this is holding up a lot of cargo, a lot of commerce, and economic benefit to New York State. 
and the businesses along the canal. It's noted as one of the, emphasis on the, biggest improvements in the enlargement era. So between the 1836 to 1862 enlargement era, this is one of the biggest improvements of putting this aqueduct in. And it's pretty darn impressive. And during that time, as I said, all this political wrangling, this is one of my favorite stories, so I, I have to throw it in here. It's a really nice long article. I shall pop back to it. Kind of explains that what's going on while Otis said he's trying to get paid for it, and it's not an operation, is that they literally have to have somebody out there making sure there's water because it is completed. Timber frame structure, trough full of water, ready for the canal. Except there's no canal connection yet. So they're, they got a guy out there literally keeping water on this aqueduct that after two years, they're trying to figure out how they're going to pay them because the canal commission fund is for construction and repairs and operation of an operational part of the system, not just to keep water on a non-operating aqueduct. And also during this period of time, you have... Again, all of this political wrangling in New York State, if the Regency could just see fit for, you know, for $90,000 to bring it up to, to the works. The Loco Focos Party in particular are, are calling out government spending uh, during this era. Uh, economic recession really brings a lot of people out. Like we've recently gone through some economic hardships and you start realizing uh, a little bit more of the vitriol that happens between not just political parties, but people in general when that happens. They're all basically saying it's going to be a benefit if we could just get this thing done. Um, and a, the wonderful nature of old newspapers are they are not what you think of as the um, completely object, like outside, like we are not taking sides news journalism that newspapers are supposed to be. Um, they are extremely political and uh, that's a lot of fun. It's sort of like cable television today. So speaking of Otis Eddy, I've mentioned him now. I'll give you a little bit more of his background. He was heavily involved in enterprises around Ithaca. He's born about 1787 in Rhode Island, makes his way into New York, sets up in the Ithaca area because Ithaca had, well, it's gorgeous, right? Everybody knows it's gorgeous, which means that there's creeks. So mill work is ideal when you have bodies of water that will help operate machinery. So Otis Eddy and company operate paper production right there at, um, at the creeks in Ithaca and what an area that becomes known as Eddyville. And then he eventually is going to turn out, he dissolves his partnership on good terms with his other folks in the paper production. And at the Cascadilla Falls, they're gonna have a cotton mill. And he's gonna employ about 15 to 20 men and about 50 to 60 children to produce about a thousand yards of cotton fabric every day. And this guy right here, Ezra Cornell, happens to get a job as a machinist working for Otis Eddy. That might be a familiar name. If you are at Cornell University now, there's the Eddy Gate. And where the giant dining hall is built now is about where the cotton mill was. Ezra Cornell gets a job as a machinist for Otis Eddy. Works for him for a few years, goes on to do some other cool things like, you know, I don't know, working with Morris and the Telegraph and, you know, establishing a amazing uh, institution of knowledge that is open to everyone. Much to the chagrin of so many people that it is open to blacks and women, and you don't have to have a particular religion to be there. And that's all kind of sets you up for the economic panic of 1837 that leads to that stop and tax law that I already mentioned. And it's also kind of the reason why the cotton mill falters and why Otis Eddy by 1838 is looking for money and a job which happens to be constructing an aqueduct. Comes up for it, again, no surprise if you've been paying attention, he gets the contract. However, it's built, and I mentioned it's complete in 1841. It takes a couple of years. He dies in 1843. There are some newspaper reports that are much afterwards saying that at some point he had received an injury during the construction of the aqueduct. No great detail behind that, despite as many times as I've looked. So if anybody tuning in or here ever comes across something, I'd love to find out more. 
Uh, but there is enough evidence that he has sustained some level of injury during the construction of the aqueduct. But he dies, leaving his wife Harriet and his sons to move forward and try to get money from the state. And he's got a wonderful uh, monument in Ithaca. And again, Harriet, his wife, uh, will die much later, but after having spent some time trying to get payment. Because back then, when you died, your creditors still wanted money. There wasn't this nice little clause at a lot of things where it's like, oh, I'm, I can fake my death and nobody will come after my money. Um, so Harriet goes, and it is 1844 that she finally gets some sort of resolution. They say that we're not paying all the money. New York State will give a certain portion of, of the money, uh, but he took out additional lines of credit. Ultimately, what, what their evidence is is that it was past due. Um, they'd extended certain parts of the contract, but he didn't complete it on schedule, so he's not getting the full amount. So his legacy winds up being, because of that mentorship with Ezra Cornell, Otis Eddy's son, James, actually is mentored by Cornell and becomes heavily involved in business. What would go on to become the American Telegraph Company becomes the president of that. His, the other industry in Ithaca around uh, the mills and stuff like that, again, I mentioned Eddyville, uh, would eventually be uh, a settlement that is absorbed by the city of Ithaca. And of course, what I like to point out is the Schoharie Creek Aqueduct, which carried the Erie Canal from that 1845 to 1916 over the Schoharie Creek. And he thought so much of that project, and it could be also maybe because he was upset he wasn't getting paid, or, you know, I don't know. Like, I'd want to put my name on it too. So actually the capstone uh, in near center of the aqueduct says Otis Eddy Builder, 1841. After its operation though, uh, again, because it goes until about 1916, but 1905, the Barge Canal Survey, they're coming out. Teddy Roosevelt had been governor. The Panama Canal had opened. This whole idea of, yeah, New York State's going to do it bigger and better again. We're going to create this new system, and we're going to canalize the Mohawk River. But what we need to do is figure out what canal system we have. We're going to do an inventory on that, what our features are, what part of the system can we move and do what with, when, as they're going to come through and decide to canalize the Mohawk River. Uh, and that 1905 survey becomes a basis. So if you come to the site, the pathway through Empire model we have, the aqueduct and lock 30 uh, is, is entirely based off of that survey. So they canalized the Mohawk River in 1916 using these impressive concrete locks that are huge. So if you haven't seen them uh, for whatever reason, you should go. Uh, any of today's modern locks are, are amazing. In the Mohawk River in particular, uh, there are these really cool uh, dams they the two of them are bridges but they are these huge uh structures these superstructures that will create a dam in the river to bring up the water uh so that kind of goes full circle the 1820s dam in the Schoharie, uh these giant movable dams that are worth a whole different presentation on infrastructure that uh, there's probably a guy out there that has a really nice book that you could get to do that if you could convince them or you should at least somebody check out the book um by mike riley so the wooden trough is removed uh, from the aqueduct. So what had held the water of the Erie Canal has been removed. There's actually some great images the Canal Society in New York has put out uh, of that process where they removed the wooden trough from the aqueduct. It's no longer being operated as a canal. So the wood actually, there's a DPW memo. They take the wood off and they take it to Rotterdam Junction where they're constructing lock nine of the current system. And they use the wood from the aqueduct as part of their coffer dams and in their construction. So it just went to a different, different canal, different structure. Uh, it becomes an area of recreation. There's uh, archaeological evidence on the aqueduct, the old towpath on the arch side where the mules and horses would pull those barges across um, of eventually vehicle traffic, um, you know, fishing implements and bullet shells and, uh, you know, just cool archaeological stuff as well as pre-Columbian artifacts that are mixed in the fill of things like hammerstones and net sinkers. So all that was pulled up from the creek bank um, as well. But, and on the opposite where our boat launches today, it was also an area of recreation. There was a, a bathhouse. People would go swimming out in the creek. Uh, so it's been an area to do that since, you know, the early 20th century. You can still come out and do that 
uh, today for the most part. But by the early 1940s, the eastern arches, these ones over to your right, are removed because the 18, or 1938 and 1939 flooding seasons were extremely difficult, flooding not just the hamlet of Fort Hunter and the town of Florida, but actually downstream, uh, even down towards Connecty and Albany. Um, and part of that flooding was because ice that had made it over the dam, you know, what remnants of the dam would get caught on the aqueduct. And uh, yet again, flooding being a major part of the history at the site. So those are removed. They're an impediment to the major flow. That's the major channel for that water. And so uh, it's an interesting noise that's coming from outside. Um, those of you on Zoom might not hear it. So I just want to point out why I had this weird expression on my face. And this is what it'll wind up looking like shortly after that. This is an aerial photo. Um, but part of the removal of arches and the degradation there afterwards winds up sort of like any good story is you kind of don't realize what you have until you're going to lose it or you've already lost it. Um, so what this does is kind of in, create an enthusiasm and a grassroots effort. And the 400 Canal Society is formed in 1955. I kind of harken back to that when I first gave you the intro of where I'm from. And the New York State Bureau of Preservation creates a site, a, a park location in 1966. And because the canal features are on the National Register and they are still state owned, the state's obviously getting involved in this a little bit more. Late 1970s, there is a preservation effort. They use a steel tendon cable system to hold back because at that point, a couple other arches had dropped because for those of you that may not be engineers, the simple thing is when you have a self-supporting structure and you have pressure, that holds it up, as soon as you remove part of it, the rest will collapse. Because the wooden trough isn't there, you don't also have a horizontal amount of stability as well. And just the ground shifting, the scour, and it not being there in its entirety, there winds up being a lot of buckling uh, horizontally and vertically on the structure. But it does, it holds it up pretty well for a little while. It's the late 1990s when two arches dropped. Uh, the steel tendon cables had rusted through and there was just too much pressure and weight they snapped and we lost more of the aqueduct. There was 14 arches, 624 feet. What remains today is six arches. And that kind of shows you a little bit of that stable. This is a picture from 1980 that shows that, that preservation effort where they, they use that and they have this kind of flying half arch as a counterbalance on those cables. Preservation League of New York to continue this story, uh, bringing a little bit more up to current, is this aqueduct that was used to carry the canal over the creek uh, in its state here in this great image by Bruce Harvey. Um, it's put on the seven save list. The Canal Society of New York had nominated it, and the Preservation League of New York said, yes, that is an important historic structure in need of preservation. It is not only important to New Yorkers as part of the Erie Canal story, but also the nation as part of this entire westward expansion and canal story as well. And it's a national landmark. It's already designated as a national landmark. Statewide advocacy because of this goes into calling for the preservation of the aqueduct. An alliance committee is formed. And with partners like the Erie Canal and National Heritage Corridor, the Preservation League, the Canal Society of New York State, and Montgomery County, where we are, Several of the local organizations, individuals, the Friends of Schoharie Crossing and the Historic Sites Bureau, New York State Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. We are moving forward with that. There will be a stabilization project. The canal uh, or the bid for that work is going out hopefully very soon and is should be the contract is executed. The work will begin sometime after the navigation season of this year, going throughout part of the winter, because again, you're doing canal work, it's easier to do it when the canal is not in operation because today's modern system controls water in the Mohawk, which also is the outlet for the Schoharie. That means that we have to wait for those dams in today's modern system to be open, reducing the water. So the preservation of the aqueduct and stabilization. Phase one stabilization is to make sure we don't lose anything else. If we don't have anything else fall in the creek, we'll repoint some of the masonry, get out some of the vegetation with hopes that a future, future preservation effort will allow people to have access on and across it once again. And some really cool dramatic photos. You can see the water line, this, this light gray is during the navigation season of today's canal, the, the water of the creek comes up to that line. 
Um, and if you were to paddle out there, you can paddle underneath that last arch that's there. And when you do so, you can also look up and see the Otis Eddy stone. But it's a great image inside the Pathway to Empire exhibit. I'm going to show you those because I got to promote. You got to stop by and see me. It's cool to get out here and talk to you, but you got to come by and check out what remains of the aqueduct, maybe see part of the dam. You can talk to me. Uh, uh, hopefully, I'll be around. I, like, I'm always there. You know my day is off. I'm there. <laughs> uh, and so you have to check out the exhibit with a great uh, model that we have. And, and this is the, the part where sometimes I like to wax a little bit more poetic. I won't go too far into it. But with this preservation effort and the renewed attention during the bicentennial, uh, a lot of attention has gone to all sorts of great canal features. Uh, from 2017 to 2025, we're doing this whole bicentennial thing. Uh, there's a great video that we'll play on the screen at some point. And Natalie and I are in a great thing talking about this. How it's a party. We're going to rock and roll until 2025. Uh, then maybe take a nap for a little while afterwards. But this is a wonderful kind of sunset. But it's not the sunset of the Erie Canal. It's not the sunset on the aqueduct. The preservation will move forward. And you can come out and visit the site. And we'll leave it to the future. The legacy that we will have, not just you know what little John had created for us, and what Otis Eddy and the countless thousands of others involved in the canal system, the construction and working along in its way that have left that legacy for us. So we can continue to do that for future generations. And I appreciate your time here today. I'm David Brooks from Scohead Crossing. Questions? There has to be some hard hitting questions. You one in the back. Oh, this is hard hitting. I just wonder, having never been there, how close is that to the Route 5 code? How those so are the questions? I'm going to repeat it for those because you might not be able to hear it through the, the microphone. To Route 5, Scoharie Crossing is pretty easy to get to. If you're coming off of Route 5, you're on the north side of the river. Uh, you Somewhere near Fort Johnson, depending on which way you're coming, there is a, a road you can go down to Mohawk Drive. You cross over dam number eight at lock E12. And you just kind of follow the roads all kind of this weird 90 degree angle. Um, but it's pretty close. If you're coming off 5S, you basically just drop off a of 5S right into Fort Hunter and you're there at our site. Um, if you want to go to the boat launch area and you want to get up closer to the aqueduct, if you stay on 5S right across from Karen's Produce and Ice Cream, I get no free ice cream for promoting them, but they do have good ice cream. Um, there are boat launch areas right across from there on 5S. So if you're coming from the east, you make a, a right from the west, you make that left, and you go down the access road through the farmer's field, and you show up at our aqueduct boat launch, and you can walk up. You can't go on the aqueduct, but you can walk up to it. If the water level is low, you can walk out underneath there and get underneath the arches and everything else. It's, uh, it's, pretty, it's extremely accessible from 5 and 5S. Uh, you get off New York State Thruway in Amsterdam, and you're, you're pretty much right there, too. So that was another reason why it was an ideal location for a historic site and museum. Uh, we have the three feet, you know, you have the original Clinton's ditch. We have a, a mile that was the feeder, or about a half mile of that. Uh, and then, of course, enlarged era features like the locks and the aqueduct. Uh, but it's just super accessible. So it's a great question. Got a question here on the Zoom. On the Zoom, okay. Yeah, uh, after the aqueduct was built, how was the old canal used as a feeder? Uh, the canal is higher than the water behind the dam. All right, so the question is, after the aqueduct goes into use, how is the old canal, Clinton's Ditch, the 1820s canal, uses the feeder? They continued, the, they kept the dam up. So actually, the, the water being fed to the east. So the dam is maintained between 8 and 11 feet, impounding the water of the creek. So it would be diverted. The east guard lock would be left open. The water fills that space, and that half mile of feeder continues to the east, and it empties back into the, uh, the enlarged canal, about where Empire Lock is. So it actually raised that water and water just has that slight gravitational downward slope because it's actually continuing. Well, if I'm, I'm gonna do it in reverse for this. So you have Buffalo here in Albany and it's all kind of going downhill. I mean, there are some ups and downs, but from our section, let's go here, you're crossing east. It is essentially downhill. And really from Schenectady to Albany, it, it is all downhill from Schenectady to Albany. So I hopefully that, that kind of explained that question. The question here. How large was the labor force to build the aqueduct? How large was the labor force to build the aqueduct? Uh, there is kind of a breakdown of that. Um, I kind of wish I had the image in here. Uh, labor force would maybe about 2025, 20, but they weren't there all the time. Uh, some of them worked a day here, a couple days there. 
Um, it wasn't a huge undertaking, um, which is probably part of the reason why it took a little bit longer. Uh, you're trying to keep your costs on labor down because you're in a financial and economic recession, but you're trying to get the work done. Um, and there's potential that there were some people that you could have been hiring to do certain jobs that aren't going to be on that canal commission report. Um, you know, you might've been paying a few dollars here and there to do some small tasks. So the labor force itself, but I roughly that 2025 that's on the list that is actually in the archives. Uh, Derek has a question. This is dangerous. The picture of the guys on the, uh, dam. Yes, the picture. Uh, what time of year was that? Like, because I noticed it looks nothing like this picture here. The uh, right. creek did. Um, yeah. So the time of year for that uh, would have been early spring. Uh, they probably had finished it up at some point, midpoint winter, a little bit later. Uh, they're all wearing the nice heavy coats or their big hats. Um, but the difference between that picture of all the engineers and the politicians standing out on that 11 foot 1864 dam is really too is the, the the major component to make the water level different is this image that's on the screen now is today's navigation which again has the mohawk river canalized dams bring up the water of the, of the river and that means that the scoharie creek water is also highly elevated so but it, it was really quite strange in 2020 to see the the creek being somewhat relatively in its natural state um we had uh, quite a few people driving up with their, their boats uh, to our boat launch, taking a big swing, realizing there's not water for a boat and driving back out. So are there additional questions? Yeah. You mentioned that there are efforts on the way to stabilize and uh, perhaps restore parts of it. Does that include like recreating, reconstructing parts of it? So the, the question is, uh, we are going through those efforts to stabilize and do more work on the aqueduct. Is that going to be uh, sort of being rebuilding it like it would have looked? Is that kind of the question? All right. Um, so yes and no. I mean, we're going to stabilize it. And there is a hope in another phase, like a phase two project, to establish a connection again to the east bank of the creek. Um, but we're all very much aware of the reasons why those arches were removed. Um, so anything that's going to recreate the appearance as it looked when it was in operation would lead to the very similar problems. Um, and we also are really cognizant of the story of it being that there was arches removed, that the engineering elements, you know, that, that, it, that it became more of a, a remnant or a ruin as people like to call it. It's still, it's remnants to me. It's not ruined. It's still beautiful. It's rise and fall of empire, Thomas Cole stuff here. Um, so we want to highlight, you know, what the, the, original portion of it is to anything else that we've done. So there's actually in the stabilization, there's going to be some concrete footings and stuff. And those are going to be very obvious that that is our effort to preserve it. Um, so anything else that would go across, hopefully as a phase two, has got to be high enough that the water and the, the ice can go underneath. I'm not an engineer, um, but it would be across that so it could flow. You're not impeding the water. There's other boat traffic, you know, bass fishermen and kayakers that you don't want to get in the way of. Um, but also turn that into that new part. Like I said, it's this legacy going forward is that, uh, that we're making every effort to preserve parts of our history for the future. So, Derek, do you have another question? I did. Yeah. Um, sort of related to my last one. It's mainly because whenever I go to Scary Creek, you know, the word creek makes mm -hmm. it sound like it's, I lived next to a creek. Right. Um, right small body of water. I noticed in one of your original maps, it's called the Schoharie River. And I was like, why? Yeah, there, and there are actually... What's the difference between a creek and a river? What's the difference? I, I, uh, this is that semantics thing yes. that's kind of interesting. Um, so I, I, I will not um, do the Merriam-Webster definitions of a creek or a river, but for a lot of intents and purposes, there are several folks that will say that the Schoharie is a river. Um, the Schoharie River Center, in particular, John McKeeby's group, will emphasize river uh, because it does wind up being wide and long. Uh, but there are several elements of the Schoharie that is very much like a creek. Um, if you go down actually to Schoharie, there are sections that are very creek-like. Um, and it really does have a lot to do with uh, the movement of it. There's a lot of oxbows to it. Again, it's about 90 miles long and it drains uh, from actually Greenton County and comes down through the Catskills and hooks north. Um, so I use the river and creek interchangeably a few times. Sometimes I call it a crick, but that's 
it's a, a whole different thing. Um, it's the Schoharie. Um, so that, that, that does, I mean, that's, there's a lot of people that really would advocate for being a river. It is so much more impressive where our site is located because particularly after it goes underneath where the throughway is that the depth does get deeper and it winds up getting wider, but that's also because it's hitting where the Mohawk is. Um, and so when the Mohawk's impounded by those dams, that water comes out. And on certain days when you drive across the bridge or sometimes on Google maps, you can see that you have a lot of that silt and sediment, that, that whole change in water color where the Schoharie is meeting into that, that river and the way that they kind of swirl in the build up there. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, there's a few other, yeah, the older maps will call it a river. There's some others that say Creek. There's some that actually spell Schoharie in a really weird way. Um, so, but it is, uh, I'll, I'll, I tend to go with Creek, um, particularly, and I'll call this an aqueduct because that's what it's listed as. And it's on all the documents that the canal commission and when it was built, it was an aqueduct and they put it over the Creek. So I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll at least play the card of historically speaking in reference to the canal features, it's an aqueduct and that's the Creek. So. Not a, question. a comment. Um, All right. Yeah. Uh, well, there's lots of thank yous. Thank okay. yous to yeah. talk. We'll come visit. Um, but then uh, Kim maybe says that the Jan maybe family owned 40 acres on either side of the mouth of Schoharie Creek in 1697. She has a copy of the deed. Very nice. And the, the Schenectady County Historical Society, and obviously with Maybe Farm, uh, which I'm uh, by by the name that you gave me, I, I'm familiar, like they should be familiar with that. Um, so yeah, Jan maybe having a, a you know. Was, Short version of it is, is that he'd married into a Mohawk family and it's a matrilineal society. They have land. And I've gotten into a couple of interesting conversations with Mary over at Schenectady County Historical about, uh, you know, who really owned it first. It's like, it's a Haudenosaunee and then, you know, it's a maybe property. And um, yeah, it's uh, a lot of really great pre-canal history. Uh, I'm doing a canal talk now, but if you are interested in, you know, settlement patterns, so the Palatine Germans and, and other uh, ethnic groups of, of Europe moving into the area. Um, it's, it's worthwhile. The fort and its history is really interesting too. The Newkirk family having lived there as well. They had purchased land. They lived on the Glen side of the Creek, um, or river, um, and had formerly, uh, maybe land as well. Um, that the, the Newkirks have been around for quite a while. They watched their houses being burnt down during the uh, 1780 Johnson and Brant raids. Um, so, there's, there's a lot to it. I just can't fit it into, which is probably more than an hour that I was given, but. The babies in the new Kirk intermarried. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. On, um, when you, when you have old families, they're, 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 yeah. And it's sort of like the, the Wemple family that had, had property there. Jan Wemp, uh, Jan Wemp was the Skinnity contractor who built the fort in 1712. And then you have Wemp's Basin. So his family eventually had property there and Wemp's Basin was a nice little stop off rest area with a canal store when the canal was in operation. And the old Wemp barn is actually in Fiora Bush now, which I, so, oh, whole bunch of tangents you could get me on, but I don't know if anybody has all day. <laughs> Additional questions? All right. So thank you very much.